morning and happy Sabbath to each one of you. It's kind of nice to have the weather a little bit cooler, isn't it? I think we're all grateful for a little piece of fall here for a few days. We don't have the opportunity when we're watching online to be connecting with people in our church family. So I'm gonna just make a suggestion that this afternoon when you are around in your home and wondering what to do with the afternoon, that maybe you send a text or make a phone call to someone who you haven't seen for a while and check in and see how they're doing. We want to give you an update about our Thanksgiving baskets. Those will look differently this year. Uh, Nancy Hall is coordinating, and but rather than us all getting together on a Saturday night and putting those boxes together, we're going to ask uh, various individuals and families to put together one or two boxes that will then be donated. So we will be giving you a list of items to purchase and a dollar amount that you can spend. You can get reimbursed for that. And so I just want you to be kind of keeping that in the back of your mind as we get closer to Thanksgiving and there will be more details coming about that later. If you are a person who has a story just ready to share, we are looking for people who would be willing to share a children's story for church. So if that's you, please contact Robbie at the church office and let her know. So welcome again. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning. Today's special offering is for Voice of Prophecy. Voice of Prophecy was founded in Southern California in 1929 by HMS Richards and continues on that ministry today with both radio programs, internet, and mail-in programs. Voice of Prophecy produces the popular Bible series, Bible Discovery, and has had over a million participants and graduates worldwide. It also produces the popular children's program, Discovery Mountain. If you're looking for great Sabbath afternoon entertainment, go on to their website and your kids will love Discovery Mountain. Our church is much bigger than just our local community. To support this worldwide ministry, mark your tithe and vote with the Voice of Prophecy. Also, don't forget our local conference and church with your tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, be with everyone that's still at home. Also, with those of us that are gathering at our church, we ask that you bless this offering and may it reach people and be a benefit. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to be able to come and worship you this morning. We're so grateful that you are a God that holds the world in your hands and how we find comfort in that right now because we need you so badly. The world is falling apart. Our country is struggling. There's so much conflict. And yet you have said that you are the Prince of Peace. So we pray that your peace will reign, that you can bring unity between people and parties and groups. Not just unity, but incredible love for each other. I pray for each person who's watching this morning that you will meet their needs, whatever those are, and that you will fill them with a sense of purpose and hope and courage for what lies ahead. Bring healing to their hearts and their bodies if it's needed. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Every pain. 
It's not too often I get to say this, but I am normal. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I'm normal as long as an Asian kid growing up in the South, in the heart of Dixie, that enjoys sweet tea. All right. Oh, all right. That's wrong. And you can't just add sweetener to your iced tea, right? You know how to do the right way? You have to brew it. And then after you brew it when it's hot, then you add the sugar. Because that's when you get the most saturation. And your tea is really sweet then, all right? So as long as you grew up in the South, you're Asian, you enjoy sweet tea, likes to fish, reads the Wall Street Journal, enjoys politics, and if that's normal, then I'm your man. If that's not, then you're probably not normal either. In fact, I think that's what our sermon series is entitled, Everybody's Normal Till You Get to Know Them. And if you haven't picked up this book yet, I would encourage you to. It's a wonderful little book. You can order it online or you can pick it up in the office. I think it's in the office, Pastor John. We still have a few more left there that you can pick it up. Our series is about how imperfect people can live in community together with other imperfect people. And one of the great stories in the Bible about community involves a paralyzed man and, a, and the friends that brought him to Jesus. I try to imagine what it might be like to live in the ancient world as a paralyzed man. And I didn't get very far, but YouTube helped me out. So I want to invite you to take a few minutes and watch this video. sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To wow, save the old man. Clearly, he hasn't read the Torah. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his home now. Well, we're right. Don't you complain when I mean, you're the one who kept stopping for lunch and morning tea and rest breaks and dessert joy and... <sighs> I'm sorry, man. I, I know this was important to you. Hang on. Levi, if you're afraid of heights, raise your hand. <laughs> what? Yay! Hey, V! Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do heal in town, but we have heard you. When the sky was wet. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Forgiving sins? Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? Get up, take your mat, and go home.
I imagine that much of his life was lived on a mat, probably no wider than three feet, no longer than about six. Someone probably had to feed him, carry him, clothe him, clean him. Probably never really knew the true sense of independence. And if that wasn't enough, the spiritual leaders of his world told him that it was his fault, that he's unclean, unworthy, unredeemable. And he may have heard this over and over again, where he might have started to believe it. We find this story in several places, but this morning we want to go to the Gospel of Luke. And I'm reading from the New, or the new Living Translation this morning, and this is my new Bible. I was, I was gifted by Mesa Grande this week. Um, our division has adopted the New Living Translation for, the, for our students in elementary school, and so they order all these books for our students. So if your children or grandchildren haven't, seen these, haven't gotten these yet, you will see these soon. But reading from Luke chapter 5, verse 17. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. And I love, love this parenthetical note. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. And they tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and they took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. I don't think that this little group of friends came about by accident. I think they faced some obstacles like we all do. Maybe there was some social stigmas. There was definitely an investment of time and energy. Yet they still chose to be friends. Relationships like this rarely happen by accident. Psychologist Alan McGinnis notes that the rule, first rule of entering into a deep friendship with people is deceptively simple. He says, rule number one is to assign top priority to your relationships. That's it. Pretty simple. Ironically, he continues, we tend to devote massive amounts of time to making money, running errands, being successful in our jobs, but we neglect giving our most valuable possession, our time, to the experience for which we were all created to live together in community. True intimacy, John Orberg says, requires chunks of unhurried time. He says if you you think that you can fit deep community into the cracks of your overloaded schedule, then think again. Wise people do not try to microwave friendships or parenting or marriage. You can't do community in a hurry. You can't listen in a hurry. You can't mourn in a hurry with those who mourn, and you can't rejoice in a hurry with those who rejoice. Which brings us to the first truth, which is that everybody has a mat. This mat that stands as a picture of human brokenness and imperfection. It's the not normal about me, about you. It's the vulnerable things that 
someone else has to carry for us. And I don't know what your mat is exactly, but maybe your mat is fear. Maybe you love to hear stories of courage and boldness. Maybe your mat is the inability to trust or the need to be in control or the inability to speak the language of the heart. Or maybe you struggle with failure or inadequacy or feelings of loneliness. But when you allow someone else to carry your mat, they see your weakness. And you might be scared and fearful even that they might drop you. And so we develop these defense mechanisms where we spend our whole lives engaged in mat, mat management. And we pretend that we don't have a mat. And we try to, be, to, to, to give off this sense of being healthy and strong to the people around us. Showing them that we can walk wherever we go. Some of us even have the spiritual gift of mat identification for others. And we have this as a primary goal to, to hide the brokenness that we may have. And we find that living in community with others is, is difficult. But as Jesus sees this group of friends with their friend on a mat, I think that he sees a group of people with an irrational commitment for the well-being of their friend. He sees an island of peace in the brokenness and love of one another, even with a giant as is tag. And so we continue reading in the story in Luke chapter 5, picking it up in verse 20. It says, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Dallas Willard teaches something called the unity of spiritual orientation. He says that in order to understand the teachings of Jesus, we have to realize one thing. And it's that we cannot have one posture toward God and a different posture towards people. Which brings us to life truth number two. If you want a deep friendship, you cannot always be the strong one. That's hard for us, isn't it? You will sometimes have to let others carry your mat. And I love this picture. Community gets built by servants. Great communities get built, gets built by roof crashers. And in great communities, people carry mats and crash roofs without asking the question, what's in it for me? And in these relationships, we forge the fellowship of the mat. There's a fly up here. But with the fellowship of the mat, there's also the irony of the mat. And it's where we find that the things that we are least proud of, the things that we are most likely to hide, it's those moments when we share those with others and allow others to carry the mat for us 
that our bonds get deeper and stronger. Because we realize that more than anything else, God uses people to heal people. Jesus revealed when he was on earth that God was ceaselessly preoccupied with finding and redeeming and loving people. And Jesus was that connection allowing us to to love God and to love people. And it's simply impossible to love the Father without having a caring heart for his people. Last week, we introduced a brand new ministry that we are so excited to be a part of called Care Portal. And I want to invite Brian Shedd to come up because he and his team are are leading this effort for us. And this is a a ministry, Brian, that um, we can partner with our communities, our two counties, Riverside and San Bernardino. And um, tell me a little bit and tell us a little bit about what Care Portal is and why you're involved with it. Okay. Uh, Care Portal is a Christian organization. Can you hear me? That would help. I like that <laughs> sign. Uh, Care Portal is a Christian organization that has uh, been established to try and bridge a gap that's been needed for a long time. And that gap is between true need in our, in our communities um, through the social services department where the people are out there on the ground, in the houses, seeing the need, uh, talking to the people, trying to help them keep their families together and get the things that they need to be able to raise healthy families. And um, the social workers, as I say, are on the ground. I, being in law enforcement, have been in many of these houses. And uh, it, is, it is truly touching to me to finally have a link between people like all of us in this room, in this church, and in this building uh, that want to help people and people that really need the help. Uh, Through the uh, care portal, social services turns in a need, it goes to their supervisor, it gets approved by their supervisor, and then it gets sent out to the people in the churches that are are, uh, uh, working with care portal. We are now one of those churches. Uh, We already, this week, uh, were able to fulfill some needs for a family. Um, Right now, our sphere is a little bit bigger because they haven't done as much in this area. Uh, They're about to uh, work with the social workers in San Bernardino County. Uh, But the family is in Marino Valley. Uh, It is a grandmother by herself that has taken in her seven grandchildren. And she was in need of a lot of things. We were able to supply several things Um, I sent out the original text, and within about 30 seconds, John texted me back and said, go ahead and get the plates and the towels for them and let them know we're covering that for now. Um, They needed dressers. They needed uh, several different things, a a table and some rugs and things like that. Um, I will say that since I spoke this morning, I have found out that I now have throw rugs and probably another table and chairs for them just by a text that I got uh, while I was uh, in between services. So this is, this is a link between real need and the ability to fulfill that need. And um, I, I think it's, as I say, we're just in our infancy. We actually weren't even ready to get going yet. I'm still working on the communication aspect. Um, I'm building both texting uh, uh, databases and email databases so that I can get the information out to the whole church. Um, I will say that this church is fairly amazing. Um, (laughs) Alana Ciccarelli texted me that a friend of hers had seen a pickup truck with a table and chairs in it with a free sign. I immediately got on the horn with Ken Beats, who was here in the area. I actually live in the Riverside area now, but I can can manage most of this on my my computer. Um, Got a hold of Ken. Within about 10 minutes, he was at the site where the truck was. Unfortunately, that that got away from us, but it was a table and chairs that were needed, and it was free. So we missed it by that much, but I wanted to say thank you to Alana because that's the kind of looking out that we need. Uh, People see a garage sale with some items, maybe wait till the end of the garage sale when they want to get rid of things for next to nothing. Um, And uh, we are going to continue to work on, we're going to build 
hopefully some storage area that we can do, get some things when, when people, people don't always have the items when there's a need, but if we can do something to kind of also bridge that, I think it's going to help a lot. So I'm very excited about this program. All right. I think one of the really exciting things about this ministry is that it's designed so that as a church, we are able to have direct contact with these families. And they are looking for communities to be a part of. And it's not just a, here, we're taking care of your physical needs, but they are searching for relationships and spiritual needs to also be met. And it's one of the, the true amazing things about this. Um, tell us a little bit about how this works. You, you, you said that there's a database and then we get emails and then we will send out text messages and emails to our members so that you all will know the need and then directly respond back. Yes. And then if we don't have it, then we get to partner with other area churches. Yeah. Right? Uh, most of the time when this gets up and running, it will be uh, mostly just in like a five mile radius of our church. So it will be people that can be involved and invited to and meant to feel like this is a home for them if they don't have someplace else that they go spiritually. So this is a really good ability for us to not just be friendly and say hi and hear some things, but to try and build friendships and bring people into this church and really help them both in the long run and in the short term. Thank you so much, Brian. Appreciate it. Thank you. Lou Smead says that um, for far too long we have confused this concept of being friendly with being friends. And I think this gives us a wonderful opportunity to do both, right? to show kindness, but to also share and live life with our neighbors. Best-selling author and pastor's wife Helen ha or Jen Hatmaker states that if Jesus is the heart of the church, people are the lifeblood. She says there's a reason he created community and told us to practice grace and love and camaraderie and presence. Because people soften the edges and fill in the gaps. And friends make up some of the best part of Jesus' story. My friend, Pastor Meshach, who's now down in San Diego, shared a slide with me this week that fits perfectly with kind of this concept that we're talking about this morning about being fellowship of the mat and, and coming together in true community. And it kind of illustrates for us how different ones of us in different stages of life experience Jesus and community together. If you are part of the, the baby boomer demographic group, I don't know if it's gonna come up here or not, but if you're part of the baby boomer demographic, the first thing that happens is most often you come to Christ, there it is, and then you find a community, and then you embrace a cause. Right. If you're a little bit younger and, and you're a Gen Xer, then you often will find a community, then find Christ, and then through that, embrace a cause. And if you fall into the millennial demographic group, then you will probably embrace a cause first, and then that will lead you to a community, and then you'll come to Christ. You may find yourself in one of these transitional groups or maybe even a subset of one of these groups. But it's very interesting to, to notice that all of us are still looking for a cause, a community, and the divine. Because they're all integrated. So this morning, I want to invite you to participate in a short five-question self-assessment. For some of you, this will be really easy, and you're going to be like, really? This is what you're asking me? And for others of you, you'll struggle, and that's okay. But I want to encourage you to make this more than just a hypothetical exercise in your brain, okay? 
So grab your bulletin and flip it over or take out your phone and create a little note as we consider these five questions together. The first question is, if you're in a crisis, who do you call at three in the morning? If you're in a crisis, who do you call at three in the morning? The second question is, who prays for you on a regular basis? Who prays for you on a regular basis? The third, who can you drop in on unannounced without feeling embarrassed or self-conscious? Who are you comfortable with? Some of us find it easy to to ask people to pray for us and express needs, but maybe this next question is harder for you because it's hard to to share with others your victories, but who can you call to celebrate a victory in some aspect of your life? Who can you call to celebrate a victory in some aspect of your life? And the last one, to what extent are you part of a fellowship of the mat these days? To what extent are you part of a fellowship of the mat these days? Was that easy? Was it challenging? Were you able to answer all of them, some of them? We crave for what people have always craved for. To be known, to be loved, to belong. Community is such a basic human need. And if what Jesus asked us to do, the thing that we are so familiar with here to to love God and and to love people. If those are our basic marching orders, then I'd like to suggest to you this morning that part of that also means that we have to be willing to be loved by God and to be loved by other people. On Thursday, Pastor John and I attended the annual Cala Mesa State of the City Luncheon. It's a luncheon that our Chamber of Commerce does every year, where they give us an update on the business developments of Cala Mesa, as well as some of the civic things that are happening. And at our table, that was sponsored actually by Mesa Grande, um, we met a new friend, and his name was Robert. And Robert was one of those that were being honored that day, And he was being honored as Volunteer of the Year for his service to the Cala Mesa Citizens Patrol. Now, I wasn't too familiar with Citizens Patrol, but after our lunch, I'm pretty confident that I can tell you all the ins and outs of the Citizens Patrol we have. Um, it's It's a wonderful, wonderful civic responsibility that he has. And from our conversation, with Robert, one thing struck out with me. And he called them Jesus churchy ideas about Citizen Patrol. And they were some of the parameters of responsibility that the Citizen Patrol have. And this is what he shared with me. He said, we are not, or we're, we are supposed to be, we are supposed to be the eyes and ears of the city, not the hands and feet. He said, the police are the hands and feet. Our responsibility is to be present, to be friend, and to assist as needed. He 
He said, we are part of a team. What an important truth to remember as we all try and be part of this fellowship of the mat. May I encourage you this week to be present, to be friend, and to assist those that are in need. But also allow others to do the same for you. Amen. Luke concludes his account by writing that everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. And may God give each of you eyes and ears to see and hear amazing things that God will do in your world this week. Amen. Amen.